discuss a book, a very important, very significant uh, book with a very, very difficult history. The first volume of Encyclopedia of the Descent. Uh, it talks about the uh, dissident movement in different countries of the Eastern Europe. Uh, starting this conversation, I think that, uh, of course, there are several English editions on the dissident movements in and comparing different types of dissident uh, actions in, diff in different Eastern European countries. For the Russian speaking audience, this is a milestone. That's the book, which will be, uh, which will open the way to the study of this topic. And I dare say that our today's conversation, which uh, can be uh, found on the online in the search engine, and uh, I suspect that a student interested in this topic uh, would be able to find this material and to listen to this um, broadcast. I think that we, uh, tonight, we're going to uh, talk about different forms, different ways of dissident uh, activities in the Eastern European countries. I want to uh, I want to ask uh, dissident experts and dissidents from different countries. I would like to uh, keep in in mind uh, one fact that whatever they say tonight, uh, they might be obvious things to you, uh, but they would be very important uh, to other people. So. As I start this conversation, first of all, uh, a few uh, housekeeping remarks. Uh, please find a globe icon. Uh, please select the language you want to uh, hear uh, the, uh, the webinar. Uh, Russian stands for Russian, English stands for English, Portuguese, uh, unfortunately, Portuguese means Polish. Uh, Zoom did not offer us Polish. Um, as a default language, so we opted for Portuguese. If you want to join the conversation, please raise your hand. There is an icon in Zoom or right in the chat box. Uh, all mics are automatically muted. Uh, if you want to uh, join the conversation, uh, your mic will be un unmuted by our engineer. I, I would like to say that I would like to thank our uh, repeat participants. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Daniel, uh, who uh, made this proposal to discuss this book. And I want to thank the contributors, uh, editors of this book, uh, uh, whom I asked to join this conversation on a, on a very short notice. Uh, and who joined this conversation. So I'm very grateful to you. I want to thank uh, the Carter Center for being able to arrange all this on such a short notice. Uh, and I want to thank the uh, Printing House New Literary Review, which published this first uh, volume of the Encyclopedia of the Descent. And the second volume is now in the process of being published. Today, we have uh, both people who worked on the Russian language version of the encyclopedia. I want to uh, introduce the authors of the original edition, which laid the foundation uh, for the Russian book. So I'm, I'm talking about the Polish edition, which was published in Poland um, almost 15 years ago. Uh, we have uh, Zbigniew Gluza, who is the chairman 
uh, of the Committee of the Garden of the Righteous in Warsaw. He is a chairman of the Carter Center, one of the largest uh, uh, think tanks uh, in uh, Poland that uh, studies uh, the history of Poland and Europe of the 20th century. We also have uh, 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 Andrzej Frischke, uh, member of the Academy of Sciences of Poland, um, a historian. Welcome. We are very glad to see Ferenc Kursik, one of the um, co-founders of the uh, under, underground journal. Uh, Ferenc Kursik also the, one of the founders of the Free Democrat uh, Movement. Uh, he was also in charge of the Helsinki Committee. Welcome. We have Pyotr Pospichal, a public figure, essayist. Uh, he signed Charter 77. Pyotr was the first ambassador of the Czech Republic to Bulgaria. He was head of the uh, Radio and TV Broadcasting Corporation. Welcome. Also, the Czech edition of the Encyclopedia of the Descent, the key, the main editor, chief editor. Uh, Piotr Pospichal was chief editor of that edition. Lukasz Kaminski. When I was working, I uh, was preparing for this conversation, I uh, was thinking of how to introduce different participants, and I saw a petition in support of Memorial, and it stated that the former head of the uh, head of the Institute of National Remembrance and supporter of Memorial, and I would like to start with this. Uh, Lokos Kaminski uh, used to be president of the uh, Platform of European Memory and Conscience, and he is a professor at uh, Wroclaw University, is teaching uh, history. If I missed important points or if I've misled somebody, please uh, correct me. We have Juraj Marushak, uh, a Slovak uh, historian, uh, political scientist, journalist. Is that correct? Uh, your mic is off. Yeah, so if I ask a question, we need to unmute uh, a participant right away. Well, we're... Yet, to be honest, I'm a senior researcher at our institute. I'm a senior researcher. Okay, good. Tonight, in addition to uh, the contributors to the encyclopedia, we also have an expert on the contemporary history of Hungary, Alexander Spikalin. Uh, he's a key, a key researcher in the Islamic Studies Institute, and Vadim Volabuyev, a senior researcher of the uh, Institute of Slavic Studies. Uh, he specializes in Polish political opposition. Alexander Yurevich Daniel, uh, he's executive editor of the Russian language edition. Valentina Chubarova. Uh, who took care of a great deal of uh, uh, organizational issues. And Larisa Yeromina, uh, who read everything, uh, corrected the errors, and it's a huge amount of work, as you can imagine. And I do hope that will Alexei Makarov will also join us uh, tonight. Uh, he was involved in the uh, publishing of the Russian language edition of the Encyclopedia of the Descent. He's here, he's with us. Alexei, good evening to you. Uh, to be honest, I uh, would like this to be uh, a lively debate because I have a plan who will speak first, who will speak later. But maybe 
now we'll talk on the some some organizational issues how this encyclopedia came about and then when we move to the, the, the dissident movement per se we will uh, as we get used to each other as we learn how to turn the mic on or off and then we'll have a more or less smooth lively conversation if uh, possible i would like to give the floor to uh, Zbigniew Gluza because uh, you uh, you originated this you are the originator of this encyclopedia you're not only the author of a, of the foreword uh, which everybody can read, but you also you are mastermind behind this encyclopedia. So, good evening, everybody. I would like to say right away that the emergence of the Russian language version of this book is a moment of metaphysical. Uh, epiphany and that was uh, enormous so the the team uh, that was working on the encyclopedia that was changing all the time we uh, thought that the russian language edition would be the final one actually the russian language uh, version emerged uh, a quarter of the century after we started work on the polish language uh, version well, the Russian language actually uh, was one of the guiding languages, was one of the key languages. We, uh, the understanding was that we'll start with the Polish language, we'll, uh, but Memorial and all other uh, partners were, were using the Russian language, and then it was translated into Russian. So my role here, uh, uh, my, 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 my uh, I would like to talk about how it all came into life. People present here know how the process uh, went on, but how did it come about? Uh, it's not quite clear. With Alexander Daniel, we tried to uh, explain it uh, in the foreword, but it was somewhat lost uh, because there are different interpretations. And we representatives of the 14 countries uh, that were involved in the dissident movement, we invited them to Warsaw in 1996. Not to write the encyclopedia, we had a, an altogether different goal and it's, it's very important. We wanted to try to mobilize dissident uh, uh, setting uh, to uh, provide a response to the events in Chechnya. That was the first aggression of Russia in Chechnya and the first autocratic uh, actions by Lukashenko in Belarus. We are certain that we, we thought that we would need to respond to that somehow uh, to, uh, to we uh, issued an appeal, we collected signatures, we spoke at different venues, uh, particularly in, in, in Poland, uh, but to the, the, the answer to the question whether we as the movement, uh, whether we are ready to speak in, in one voice internationally, our common answer was no we could not speak in with one voice uh, seven years after the political transformation in poland five years after the breakup of the soviet union our environment our community uh, was this 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 disintegrated and we were engaged in different political groups we had different political likings and for the first time we met after a long time and we came to an understanding that the first that 
we needed to do is is to write down the history of this movement because nobody else would do it if we people who were part of this movement don't do it nobody will that's why we took up this um, idea uh, to uh, to create this encyclopedia that was our joint idea uh, an encyclopedia with thousands and thousands of uh, entries, articles. It was a very ambitious project. And uh, over 11 years, we were able to collect only 350 biographies. So you can you could get the feeling of this of the scope of the work. A very important thing took place. Very important development. Of course, the authorities in, in power now, they used to be in opposition, but we're not going to go into that now. But the opposition movement at that moment uh, didn't have any sway over the situation, could not affect the situation. So if we, the fact that we can now turn to the traditions, uh, thanks to this of volume one, a Russian language, uh, volume two would be even more important because it would deal with the Soviet Union and all those countries where the dissident movement was, to some extent, uh, was exemplary. Uh, the, the committee in Poland uh, made direct references to the Soviet committee because if they were prepared to act, our Polish committee also should be able to act openly. Of course, we don't have time to go into this in detail, but what we managed to create, uh, first the Polish version, then the Czech, uh, then now Russian, and to the, some, some fragments were translated into Ukrainian, uh, German, and Lithuanian. It's a phenomenal success because it's a bottom-up process. We realize that many countries lack archives. Memorial has its archives in Moscow and th their archives turn out to be uh, exemplary. We in Poland, we created uh, archives of the opposition and we were uh, working on our w Polish encyclopedia. And we knew who to incorporate into that encyclopedia many countries many countries the situation was different uh, so in uh, belarus they had to create the first archive in bulgaria they had to create such an archive from a scratch so we uh, launched a process this very important process for the history of europe which uh, at the end of the day became documented and I would like to uh, bow deeply before Memorial and uh, to a great extent uh, before Natalia Garbanevska, Arsenia Raginsky because their energy uh, played an instrumental role in this undertaking. Uh, of course, Alexander Daniel who brought this to fruition uh, Russian contribution, the Russian version of this encyclopedia is the most important uh, development in this process over the past 25 years. So I would like to thank you all for this. Uh, thank you so much. I would like to ask Alexander Yulevich to uh, speak briefly about uh, how you envision uh, the, uh, the the past and the future destiny of this encyclopedia. To begin with, I would like to say that I'm enormously pleased to see uh, uh, many of my colleagues, uh, some of them I haven't seen in a long time. That's the first comment. Secondly, uh, the project as it is the way it was started in 1996. Of course, uh, it was driven by uh, Zbyszek Bluza, and I'm particularly happy to see him uh, here. As regards the Russian language version of volume one, 
the one we're discussing tonight, um, which was published at the end of last year, a huge uh, contribution was made uh, by Vaila Chubarova and her initiative. Without uh, Vaila, this wouldn't have happened. But also, I would like to mention another person present here tonight who extended huge support to the Russian version. Uh, Alice Gluza, she's here. Alice, thank you so much for everything you've done. Without your contribution, this volume wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have become a reality. So, what else can I add? Zbigniew has uh, said everything. He he's covered everything on the history side. Uh, this project took a quarter of a century. It's not over yet because we uh, have volume one um, in 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 paper form. Uh, the Russian version of volume two is ready, uh, but hasn't been published yet. There are several obstacles related to its printing the printing of volume two in Russian, we hope to be able to resolve them. If I understand, if I remember correctly, 20 years ago, I read some fragments from the would-be encyclopedia, uh, the NLO uh, publishing house. The Russian audience have been looking forward to this uh, for a long time. Yes, you're right. The, uh, NLO journal uh, published some materials and other um, other uh, publications, um, uh, other pre periodicals also published other fragments and articles on this topic. So somehow we would be able to uh, get the second volume published as well in the near future. We need it badly. But what I would like to say, when we with Larisa Simeonovna Yeromina, when we were working on the on both volumes. I had a feeling that uh, we didn't know exactly what we needed more, an account for the Russian reader, a Russian speaking reader on the Soviet uh, dissident movement, or more importantly, an account uh, of uh, the dissidents in the Central and Eastern Europe because that experience was uh, totally unknown to us. As I was working on the uh, Russian volume, volume one of the encyclopedia, I was discovering very unexpected facts, very interesting facts, very important uh, facts uh, for the Russian speaking reader. So it was an incredible feeling. Isn't it, isn't it so, uh, Larisa Simeonovna? It was incredible. The fact that the volume was published, I think it's of huge importance to Russia. So thank you so much, everybody who was involved. I think that uh, it encourages want to think of the uh, huge amount of differences and similarities. And I think it basically encourages people, encourages people's interest in further research. I would like, if I may, uh, uh, Alexander Yulevich, maybe you will speak briefly uh, how it all started by Natalia Garbanievska, or maybe uh, Vare should should speak on that. It should be done by Vadi, yes, because she was the closest uh, aide, she was the closest assistant to Natalia Evgenievna uh, over, unfortunately, not a very long period when she was involved in this publication. And if Vadi hadn't picked up the banner after Natalia Garbanovska's death, nothing would have come out of this project. Good afternoon. I would like to say Alexander Yulevich. I think it's from uh, Strogatsky's novel. Uh, that's how bombshells are born. 
uh, you know, to say that I was a, a, cl a close aide to Garbanevsky. Actually, I was one of only one of the translators when in 2008 she uh, suggested I should get involved. It was a huge gift. It was a huge confidence. I translated two and a half sections. It was my first experience of this kind. And uh, it, I could never think that, could never imagine that uh, many years later I would pick up this banner because I asked her once in a while how the encyclopedia was coming along. She, could, she didn't say anything in particular after her death. There was nobody to turn to with questions. So uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I joined this project at the end of 2016 when Zbigniew invited me uh, to join the team in Warsaw uh, with Masha, the translator who's also here. And he said that there is a project of this kind. He didn't know that I was a translator. He uh, thought, he assumed that we all Russians living in Warsaw, we could become intermediaries and pick up the banner. As a translator, I uh, became a, uh, an intermediary, a link. I received a memory stick from Zbigniew with uh, the materials uh, on the encyclopedia from Garbanievskaya's computer. So he told me, here's a memory stick, do something about it. That memory stick, I received it uh, in Wroclaw from uh, Garbanievsky's son, who actually downloaded material onto the memory stick uh, from her computer, and he handed me. Yes, so she, that memory stick basically went for you, and then it came back to you as a boomerang. Today, I, I was thinking that that memory stick, you know, for about a year it was lying on my desk, and I was trying to figure out how to approach it. It took quite a while to figure it out. And I was basically, I felt like uh, I was holding a glimmering Kindle wood. Uh, uh, maybe I didn't fan out a flame, but I made sure it didn't extinguish, didn't uh, go out. So that memory stick is still on my desk. So when you think of the way from that memory stick to this volume, it's uh, an impressive success. And and of course, Natalia Evgenia put a lot of effort into this. And volume one we're discussing tonight, actually, it was already made up into pages. It was already formatted. Uh, of course, we had to, uh, my, my, my job was to update uh, bibliographies. But she had essentially uh, brought the work on volume one uh, to completion. And what we managed to pick up this uh, glimmering kindle wood and fan it into a flame. I think it's amazing. And I think I happened to be the right person at the right place. And it, it was, I was very fortunate. It was uh, very fortunate of me to uh, end up in this project. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, we're moving on uh, towards, uh, the chapters and historical essays in the encyclopedia. We don't have to stick uh, to the order of chapters in the encyclopedia. We can uh, pick up different topics as we move along. I would like to ask to unmute, unmute uh, Ferenc Kursig uh, because we're very fortunate tonight that uh, tonight we have uh, a person uh, who knew Hungary in and remember Hungary in, in 1956, 1957. And I would like to ask, yes, we'll start with Hungary, if you don't mind. When I was reading your essay, in the Encyclopedia of the Descent, I was vexed by a question. When we talk about dissent, one, why do we need the word dissidence when we can use the word opposition? So three uh, concepts, dissent, opposition, some is not. We, uh, maybe we confer something extra, we inject some extra meaning so do we bring our own understandings, uh, Russian uh, 
interpretations of this uh or shall we leave it as it is what do you think opposition or dissident this is dissent uh could you please unmute the mic are you asking me yeah. uh, i think opposition is better of the opposition is much much better because uh, in the hungarian dissident um they used to have an other, uh, absolutely other meaning Dissidents were called people who left the country. And this is, was a very, very pejorative uh, expression. So for those people who illegally left the country uh, uh, during uh, the communist time. And, and it had nothing to do with, uh, with uh, the political opposition. The political opposition started later. Uh, I would like to, I have the two remarks before. Uh, one is technical. Uh, the English translation is uh, rather hard to understand. So I, I don't know why is that, but but at the beginning it was uh, quite uh, quite understandable, and later it became much less and less understandable. So I don't know if it's possible to to uh, uh, do something for for uh, 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 for a better. Um, uh, uh, the second thing is uh, is uh, even more complicated. Uh, it is uh, the, first, first, uh, the first one is not complicated actually. Just it's a, it, it is a, I think that it's a, mainly a technical question. Uh, but the other thing is that, uh, uh, as you mentioned, this uh, uh, this uh, uh, effort to uh, make an, an, an encyclopedia of um, of the opposition of the. Uh, Soviet and East European of the opposition is quite old. So I remember that sometimes in the in the mid nineties, uh, a Polish uh, lady came to Hungary. Uh, she is, uh, spoke excellently Hungarian, uh, and uh, and uh, she mentioned this uh, this uh, effort to make a international uh, book on the opposition movement. And uh, uh, several people were involved. Uh, uh, two of us uh, were, were, were uh, uh, from the side of the so-called democratic opposition, but there were other members of the so-called populist opposition uh, for the Russian uh, uh, audience. I think it's the more understandable if I, if I use the, the traditional Russian word, narodniki. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, also other people who uh, were in actually not absolutely against the communist re regime, but one uh, tried to uh, support the this nationalist uh, side of the regime. Uh, so on the on the very end, uh, uh, I wrote uh, a quite long. Uh, essay on the history of the Hungarian opposition. And then uh, I was told that it's too long. I should make a shorter version. So I did it. And uh, after that, nothing happened. So I thought that this, this, uh, uh, this uh, enterprise uh, uh, became disappeared. Uh, and uh, much, much later, uh, maybe three years ago, maybe in in in, nine, in uh, 2018, uh, I was asked to write a, a, an essay about the history of the Samizdat paper, the speaker, uh, which I was one of the editors. And this was the first and maybe the main uh, Samizdat uh, periodical of the Hungarian opposition. So I did it, and it was uh, translated by uh, Yuri uh, Gusev, who is a very good Hungarian translator. Uh, and uh, uh, at that, uh, in the meantime, the uh, uh, epidemic started. So I lost the connection again. And now as you, uh, you came and you, you uh, wrote me, then I, I, it turned out that uh, this uh, this uh, essay about the 
about the history of uh, of the Sami of this very one Samizdat paper was published in this book, but it is not the same as I wrote for the Kata. Well, so that uh, this is something as well, but uh, it is it is so it's some somehow it is a um, if if this about if the book is about the history of the uh, opposition movements in the uh, Soviet in the Soviet Union and in Eastern Europe, I said this essay is not about it. It is uh, uh, just about the history of one one of the some is not papers, so it, which is. Uh, I, I, I actually I don't know. Certainly, I. I no, what is that? You have encyclopedia. <laughs> but actually, you have uh, an entry, an article in the, in the encyclopedia. You have a large article in the encyclopedia, don't you? I I I, I did did write it, but I don't know what happened to it. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, looking at this, uh, because because Olga sent me the. The, uh, uh, the volume which was, which was not published in Russian, uh, and uh, I looked at the uh, content, and I saw uh, my new my new uh, my new article about uh, the Samizdat uh, periodical, which I wrote uh, three years ago, but uh, I didn't see any anything else uh, from me you know, about the Hungarian uh, Hungarian. Um, uh, opposition movement in the in this book. Uh, maybe I was so I, maybe I didn't remark on something. Didn't notice something. But I I think that there is no uh, uh, general uh, general uh, uh, chapter on the on the Hungarian dissident movement. Uh, I don't know what is uh, what is what, what is go going on later. So that I going to, uh, if I understood well, you are going to to publish other books uh, on the, on this issue. So this is not uh, the encyclopedia was not closed down. Uh, well, actually. Your article is in the encyclopedia. Your article is in there. So in in this in the same book as the uh, the, the this uh, 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 what is in the Saboda. Uh, 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 well, your the, my article article, the, article for the Polish version that you wrote. Uh, yeah. yeah. It is published now. Da. Da. Yes, da. correct. Okay. Yeah. I would like to ask. Uh, I would like to unmute uh, Zbigniew Gluza, uh, Gluza and uh, Alexander Daniel, please. Well, I think uh, opposition or dissident. A key question. We are both both participated in lively international debate on how to name this book. Shall we include the word dissident? Uh, shall it be in the title or somewhere else? And Alexander Daniel, uh, his voice was uh, decisive. The uh, only Poland had opposition. Other countries had dissidents because. That was the movement. Uh, since in Poland, since the dissident movement transformed into a solidarity movement, which uh, was which affected the politics. I'm not going to remind you of the history, so we can uh, uh, say that that was a success in the opposition movement. But still, uh, we cannot use Polish perspective to dominate the uh, experience of other countries. Uh, so it seems to me that that the key point is that I would agree with Alexander, dissent 
as in the Encyclopedia of Dissent. I think that's the right, the apt usage of this term. In our foreword, we provide explanation why we use the word dissent. Um, I don't have time now to go into that. And I was asked to remind you that all uh, contributors and editors thought that was a hopeless project. Nobody thought that would be a success because it was such an enormous project. Nobody thought, nobody believed in its success, but uh, one step at a time, we uh, made it happen. Uh, it's important to uh, remind you that shortly before death, uh, uh, he sent a letter to Alexander. It was a testimony of sorts. Uh, Uh, he said that we shouldn't forget about this project. Uh, he wrote that we uh, must make sure that this encyclopedia is published and the encyclopedia was published, so we uh, executed his will. Thank you so much. Uh, well, we actually have executed half of the will, not fully, partially. Uh, uh, Zbigniew, we could talk about the right or wrong terms for a long time, and I partially agree with you. I have something to add. Uh, I have something to uh, oppose, but, but I I, I'm afraid that would just degenerate into a, a fight over definitions. That's not the key thing. That's not the most important thing. I would like to say also that uh, to respond to Mr. Kursik, the article uh, which uh, was was incorporated in the Russian language Encyclopedia of the Dissent, an article on the Hungarian opposition or dissent. Um, it, it, there, so there is an article on the uh, Hungarian dissent. Uh, it includes some section of on the uh, Hungarian uh, some is that, and I think that's the first article you talked about. It's not only about some is that, but it, it talks a bit about some is that, not limited to that. When we started working on the Russian language version of volume one, what one of the one of the strongest impressions that I had, the new things which I learned, what uh, what impressed me most, uh, it, it came from Ferenc Kursik's article. Actually, I jotted down some uh, some ideas. I just want to cite this uh, segment. I will cite. I will. I will quote. So it's it's about the samizdat and how about the different meanings uh, that in different countries people have for the word samizdat. Uh, so a, a quote, experience, which is uh, the, these authors, Blensi, Kish, Narasti, Konrad, and others, gained as a result of the contacts with the state publishing uh, houses, uh, indicated that free intellectual exchange can be done only uh, on the uh, free and independent publishing market, unquote. So the problem, that's again speaking from me, the, the problem of ensuring freedom of thought, that's the key problem for the dissidents, uh, is viewed by the author and other Hungarian dis dissidents, not as an immunity against political repressions. Uh, an issue of political repressions is not even raised. Uh, it's a matter of creating free and independent publishing market. And that that says about something, doesn't it? The Hungarian samizdat is a unique phenomenon uh, for a socialist country. As we understand, it res resembles more samizdat uh, the, in in the USA and Western Europe. Uh, a short uh, short run publications or journals 
or we can also uh, cite perestroika era publications, uh, short run publications. But uh, this quote refers to the 60s and 70s, and there was no perestroika in Hungary at that time. And the forms of Samizdat activities in Hungary, from our Russian standpoint, they were uh, enormously exotic. For example, exchange of diaries, Samizdat by subscription, Samizdat by uh, mail, so mass mailings. Uh, in the early 80s, uh, there was a bookstore in Budapest, uh, a bookshop, uh, which dealt in uh, Samizdat publications. Uh, Laszlo Reich, the architect, uh, the son of uh, Laszlo Reich, who was uh, executed in 1949 following a show trial. So, uh, an anecdote, I don't know if it's true or not, but somebody told me uh, uh, when Kadr, when he was asked for a sanction to arrest the owner of the, 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 the bookshop owner, he answered, no, I cannot uh, sanction the arrest of a person bearing the name of Laszlo Reich. I don't know if it's true or not, but that's, uh, that's the story I heard from somebody. So, uh, incredible openness of Samizdat uh, activities in Hungary. And I, I've, I view it as, a, as an open activity. And that's probably a result of the specifics of the, the, the features of the local situation on the ground. Uh, of course, the authorities uh, were very hesitant uh, to apply pressure uh, towards dissidents in Hungary. And when dissidents arrived at the conclusion formulated by Kosik, the main idea became not conspiration, but uh, rather uh, ensuring mass circulation. And uh, Hungarian uh, dissidents uh, wanted to move beyond uh, uh, typewriters. They want to use more advanced technologies. And that speaks a lot about the Hungarian situation. And there are different forms of Samizdat in different countries. And in, that's what uh, struck me in Kursek's article, the, the, the particular attributes, uh, the specific features. Just to add to that, uh, the recently published article uh, I think last year it was published on uh, one uh, magazine. Uh, uh, that's, uh, that's an article by Ferenc Kosek. Thank you, uh, Alexander Georgievich. Now we uh, are receiving comments. Alicia Gluza. Uh, Uh, very briefly, I would like to add uh, to uh, what Kosek Ferenc has said. I have two volumes uh, of the encyclopedia, Russian and Polish editions. In both editions, we have your big article that actually opens uh, uh, the chapter on Hungary, seven, page 774 in the Polish version. Uh, yes. uh, and so you can find the same article in the Russian language version as well. Thank you. Polish and in Russian Lukasz Kaminski. Uh, the, the mic, please. Uh, could you please unmute Mr. Kaminski? Thank you. Thank you very much. If possible, I would I would like to put our book into perspective. This publication allows allows us to take stock of the opposition movement. We can compare. We can think and 
discuss uh, unique features of uh, each country and each movement. But I think we can uh, uh, look at this unique phenomenon from a different perspective. That's a history of opposition seen through the prism of individuals, their personal histories. And from this perspective, we can talk about uh, values. We can uh, contemplate why these different people at some point in their lives decided to stand up against the regime. And it shows uh, something universal and something relevant to us. Nobody is born a hero. At some point, people make a decision and those decisions define their way forward. And I think it's, uh, it's a very universal, it's very common. It comes from all these stories. Uh, we talk about different groups of people from different countries. Uh, there were separate people like the Polish opposition in the 70s. Uh, it was just a handful of people who decided to stand up against evil. They actually didn't believe that they would succeed. They never thought that their uh, actions against a huge empire would lead to anything. But they won at the end of the day. And I think we need to look at those stories uh, maybe from uh, an, an orthodox position without criticizing with we need to uh, look at it as a something which would be ever relevant to us. Uh, it would always be relevant. So uh, it's very important that we have the encyclopedia. Uh, uh, the result, the result, what matters. Uh, and that's an incredible value of this publication. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I would like, uh, I would like to ask a question on Psych Czechoslovakia. I would like to ask to unmute uh, Peter Pospichal uh, and Juraj Marushak. I'm reading three historical essays at the same time. One on the Czechoslovakia, one on Czech Republic, another on Slovak Republic. And I have an impression that we're talking about three different countries, three different pictures, three different prospects. It seemed to me that in uh, Yuri Marushak's article, uh, more focus was made on um, art, on on the importance of alternative culture. So my question would be phrased as follows: Your different, uh, sorry if it's a difficult question. All different prospects. Your different. Uh, different, uh, uh, different, uh, different views, different angles that you used uh, when you were talking about essentially the same thing. Uh, what was uh, the most important thing you want to underline in your respective uh, articles? Uh, Yuri Maroshak, uh, please go ahead. I want to ask him to, to start. Well, uh, actually, I want to uh, give you the floor first because you Actually, you were in charge of the uh, Czechoslovak uh, section and you're older than I am. So you, well, I wanted to follow up on what you say. So I, I, I want to make it smooth. I, I, I want you to, 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 to put it into context. You want me to start? Yes, please. All right. Okay. Of course, with it's a difficult question with Czechoslovakia because it used to be one country, now almost 30 years, uh, they're, they're the two countries, uh, they feel close affinity, close mentalities, uh, 
public debates are very, uh, very close, very similar. So very similar countries altogether. And uh, so we are the closest countries. Of course, history uh, had uh, different destinies for us uh, in Slovakia back then. The dissident movement, the, the dissident movement uh, had different uh, characters, and they supported different kinds of activities. We, they cannot be compared to each other because the Czechs, uh, mostly in Prague, uh, they used to be a, a, a political dissent, political opposition. That uh, that were part of the political circles, and that was born out of the political context more so than in Slovakia. Of course, there were artists, uh, there were Catholics, uh, evangelists. Uh, they were all members of this movement. But first and foremost the opposition, the dissident movement, uh, it was first and foremost was politically driven in terms of in terms of political dialogue because all of us we were uh, defend defenders of human rights. Since I lived, I was living in Brno at that time and I I would travel often to Prague, to Bratislava. I met with the dissidents on both sides and you could very easily, you could notice a different context in, and, and the, the, air, the issues people were interested in. And Yuri, uh, if you could follow up on that and maybe elaborate on the differences uh, between uh, the Slovaks and the Czechs, and then I will I will I will continue with my thought. Okay, what was in very interesting to me when we uh, started this work on the Encyclopedia of the Descent? It's that the. Uh, circle of dissidents, uh, the circles of dissidents uh, were very closely knit and the human rights movement in Slovakia, they could, could uh, have developed their cause without involvement of dissidents from Prague because they could uh, do that on their own. In spite of that, even though we are very close countries, our languages are even 30 years after the breakup of Czechoslovakia, at the interpersonal level, we, we speak the same language, but it turned out that Slovakia and the, Ch the Czech Republic turned out to be two different countries, two different societies. And that was amazing. That was striking how different the Slovak society, for example, um, viewed the period of the 70s and the 80s, the so-called period of normalization, when in the Czech society, it was viewed as the destruction of national sovereignty, as suppression of all creative freedoms, as suppression, a total uh, rollback as a national catastrophe in, in Slovakia until today, until now, uh, the middle age generation and older age generation, they still view the 70s and the 80s, the Brezhnev period of the Soviet Union. So uh, what we call, we, they view it as the normalized normalization. They view it as the, the best period in the history of the country. And 
one country, uh, you know, there was one regime in the country, it was the same Communist Party was running the country, but in the Slovak society, uh, it turned out that they had more opportunities to integrate a broad, broader uh, layers of population into the and, and to marginalize the dissident movement, which uh, was very much uh, limited. And the way it's viewed by Mr. Daniel or Mr. Pospichal. So it was mostly human rights defenders. It was a purely intellectual movement. That's how it was viewed. There were probably 10 or 20 true dissidents in Slovakia and other dissident groups, opposition groups, they were either related to artistic expressions, uh, so-called artistic underground or alternative culture, or they were related to environmentalism, or even national factor uh, played a very important role. For example, among the Catholic dissidents, uh, who uh, were actually referring to the traditions of the Slovak Catholicism, and uh, uh, since the World War II, uh, and the national uh, national issue emerged in the Slovak-Hungarian relations, a uh, Slovak minority or Hungarian minority accounted for 10% of the Slovak population, and uh, among those that minority. A committee uh, for the protection of the rights of the Hungarian minority in uh, Czechoslovakia emerged. And uh, even though this organization uh, emerged in the late 70s, the first contacts were made only at the end of the 80s. So in the same city, in the same small country of Slovakia, uh, there were several groups that didn't maintain any contacts among each other. And they had no idea about each other or didn't want to know about each other. And only when uh, when the, uh, the big break came, when the political transformation period came, that, that, that's when the first attempts at dialogue were made. So the dissident movement, as Lukas said, it was a, a movement of the people who were uh, opposing the regime. At the same time, dissident movement is, is part and parcel of the national history. And the dissident movement, the story of, or the history of dissident movement uh, reveals all the historical problems and the conflicts and reflects them. So the conflicts and in the Central and Eastern Europe, uh, paradoxically, it is the Encyclopedia of the Descent, our joint publication uh, that, be, that, that also uh, continues our polemics with Václav Havel, uh, who were talking about the theory of refrigerator. He, he was saying that all conflicts uh, after 1948, all conflicts were uh, put in deep freeze, among conflicts between our countries, Central Eastern European countries. It turned out that it's not the case. All those conflicts, all those debates, they continued throughout that period, and our societies were, thanks to the dissident movement, uh, they were, they, they 
they they became quite different uh, from what they were in 1945-1948. So the history of the dissident movement um, also um, uh, confirms that. Thank you. Well, I would like to follow up a bit. I wouldn't want to argue with uh, Yuray Marushak, uh, but I must say that what he called polemic with Václav Havel, Havel can be uh, explained as follows. It's a matter of perspective. Uh, if you said it in 1990 or 1992, of course, the prospect was different, or the perspective was different uh, uh, compared to the modern day, you know, from the standpoint of 2022, the 21st century. So it's a totally different perspective. And that's another important point. Uh, also, Mr. Gluza said that the process of creating this encyclopedia of the dissident has been going on for 25 years and uh, that's Im important to say that in, back in 1996-97 I think I joined the process in 1999 it was still a living matter now it is part of history. We ourselves are a, a history to an extent. When people invite me to uh, to different uh, shows or media debates, people look at me as at a historical figure. So you you, you get the idea. So. 30 years later, and the perspective changes altogether. So this project is important. Why? Because it helps to preserve memory. It records uh, something which cannot be recorded with other means and the people who participated in various interesting activities in those years they helped to uh, fight for human rights when it was very important a very important cause now uh, a great number of those heroes of our encyclopedia they are no longer with us anymore. Maybe we should uh, consider something different. Uh, we still have time left to make some video recordings of people who are still with us because in 10, 20 years, they will, they will all be gone and all we'll have left is uh, written documents. So, Memorial, think about it. I know you're having serious issues with the authorities and I wish you uh, success in overcoming those difficulties. But if you have energy, if you have opportunities, we can do it outside of Moscow or St. Petersburg. We can do it in Prague or Bratislava, for example, to uh, record meetings and conversations with some of the figures in the encyclopedia while they're still alive, while there's still time left to talk to them about their lives. And if you can, for example, um, set up a YouTube channel, I think it might be of interest uh, to the, the Russian audience and not only the Russian audience. So that's what you can think about. That's that's it from me. Thank you. Lukas Kaminski. Uh, 
dziękuję bardzo. No to jest takie może troszeczkę zaskakujące, że polski historyk został właśnie poproszony o napisanie It's surprising that uh, a Polish historian was asked to write a, a chapter on Czechoslovakia, but the, f the fact that the differences between the Czech, Czech, Czech Republic and the Slovak Republic, those differences could be uh, more easily spotted from a distance. Maybe that's the reason why. But all in all, we are talking about an external uh, perspective of a view from outside uh, and we see that that the Czech dominates over the Slovak part in the 70s and the 80s uh, the, the the last 20 years uh, uh, we were focusing on the Slovak history. Uh, the, the differences are obvious. Uh, Slovak opposition did exist, but it assumed different forms. And th that's our contribution to our general discussion today, whether we're talking about opposition or dissidents. In the case of Slovakia, we're talking about independent uh, Catholic circles, underground church. Uh, their goal was not so much resistance. Uh, they just wanted to be able to exercise their religion without state control. They wanted to uh, exercise their values, uh, uphold their values. Of course, it br brought them into conflict with the communist authorities. And there's, there's a paradox. Who is the opposition? Who should be mentioned as the opposition? It was up to the authorities to decide whom to name opposition, not the opposition itself. So I think these processes of remembrance we are talking about today, I think they allow us to identify the various forms of uh, dissent and opposition on the Slovak side as well. Although an image we have will never be full uh, or balanced because the Czech opposition was much more pronounced, much, much stronger. Even back in those days, it, it had a higher profile than the Slovak opposition. But we're getting a fuller picture and this is related to the uh, process of the Polish historical memory because we're looking for a reference points in our past. For many nations of the Central Europe, uh, the history of opposition serves as, as such a reference point. Thank you. We have some comments. Vadim Valabuev, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'd like to welcome everybody. I have a quick uh, remark, uh, a narrow re technical remark. I read uh, a Russian translation of the Polish side, uh, a, a segment uh, dealing with the 50s and the uh, 70s written by Andrzej Frischke. I think it also mentions uh, the 80s, but I, I read only on the earlier period, translator made a, a mistake, a, a, a bad one. He mentions Europe literary society. There was no literary society uh, of this kind. Uh, readers may associate it with the uh, uh, Petofi literary society in Hungary. As we know, it, uh, it, it, it was the uh, the, the origin of the Hungarian Revolution in Polish, in the original, uh, it stated, uh, it, 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 it says Europe uh, Literary Society, but it was a group of writers in 1957 who wanted to uh, publish Europe uh, magazine. They were, the application was denied. And uh, later they were always called Europe group, but there was nothing common 
between those uh, writers. There was no Europe literary society per se, so uh, you need to uh, clarify this point. In addition, um, I'm a bit surprised when I saw the Eastern Europe on the uh, on the uh, uh, front page of the book uh, for for Poland it's a matter of principle because Poland is not Eastern it's it's a Central Europe maybe in opposition to the Western Europe but I think it's not a, a the right it's not the, the apt title I also have a question to both Polish participants uh, to Mr. Kaminski and Mr. Frischke in the segment I read didn't have any mention of Lech Walesa, which is clear uh, because it was before the Solidarity movement. But in the present day Poland, uh, people hold diametrically opposite views on Lech Walesa. It is now proven that he cooperated with the security services in the early uh, 70s. Uh, you also mentioned Zdislav Neider as one of the co-founders of the Polish National uh, Liberation Agreement or Accord. He also cooperated with the security services uh, from 1959 till 1963. And this organization uh, was uh, founded 20 years later. Uh, nevertheless, I'm more interested uh, in the people's attitude to Lech Walesa, whether his contribution was reassessed in the history textbooks. Uh, when Roman Gertich was Minister of Education, he raised this issue of uh, reassessing the, uh, the legacy of the Round Circle and Lech Walesa. I think it's a very pressing, very sensitive issue. So that's the question I want to ask. Of course, if there are aware if they know how Lech Walesa is being talked about, not in the scientific circles, but rather in the history textbooks. Thank you. Thank you. Could you please unmute Andrzej Frischke and uh, Lukasz Kaminski? Hello, good evening. Yes, uh, there was no Europe club. A, a group of uh, writers in 1957, they wanted to publish a, a magazine. They actually made the first issue. It was never released. Those writers were expelled from the party. It was a group of uh, men of letters, Adam Vajek, very well known ones. Uh, maybe some of you know his, this name. A poem for the adults, which uh, played an important role in Poland, or Vladislav Yastrin and others. They were party members. It was an important group in the history of, of Polish communism in the post-war period because they created their magazine uh, called Forge. Uh, it was it, it was uh, published from 1945, and they supported systemic changes in Poland. They were very active in Stalin's time. In 1956, they started to uh, rebel. In the context of this discussion opposition versus dissidents uh, they were dissidents they were thought to be communists they uh, wrote political uh, essays but then they started uh, to rebel uh, they uh, turned towards europe they drew inspiration uh, from europe in the in european literature culture and uh, that uh, was negatively looked upon by the Polish authorities and their names played an important part in Polish history in the 70s they also emerged in different contexts 
related to the independent unofficial culture so much about Europe of course the word club should be uh, omitted it should be replaced with the word group so Europe group now on to Lech Valenza it's a much much more complex issue I think this has something to do with the fact that if we take a closer look at the history of the 70s uh, we have 20 uh, major figures from uh, that period Valenza is not one of them he became popular only in August 1980 and since that time he became a uh, number one person number one in the solidarity movement in the opposition but we can we cannot call him a dissident it's it would be impossible because the word dissident implies that a dissident used to be part of the system used to be part part of the ideology part of the organized society and then at some point he cut ties he redefines himself that wasn't the case with Valenza uh, he was never part of this system he was never important for the system he was never a party member he was never a Marxist nothing of this kind he was just a working man he was a worker he was a Catholic he was a rebel he was uh, uh, and on and on and then he appeared in 1980 uh, there was an editorial difficulty as we were publishing the Polish uh, encyclopedia uh, the question was whether we should include solidarity movement leaders into the encyclopedia or not uh, it seems that it was something different the solidarity was something different and we drew a line of sorts we decided that the encyclopedia would contain names of people who were involved in uh, unofficial illegal structures movements illegal groups that were opposing the system fighting against the system and again Valencia doesn't make the mark again because he was never involved in any illegal activities even after the the martial law when he he left the center for the interned uh, of course he was uh, mistreated terribly by the authorities but he was not involved in any illegal activities it's a difficult case because we have the, a leader of the movement starting from 1980 Um, he was uh, he was outside of the system that's what I wanted to say about Valenza Valenza today in Poland it's a huge problem and people's attitude to Valenza is one of it's one of the criteria one of the dividing lines in the Polish society some uh, segments of the society uh, related to the solidarity movement they still view him as a, an opposition leader for their opponents for those who are in power now this uh, this uh, this man his his good name should be destroyed his good reputation should be destroyed uh, Lech Valenza is still being presented as a person who um, cooperated with the security services who uh, played a, a bad role a destructive role and uh, there they say that there's no reason why we should have any respect for this person 
So it's a very deep emotional conflict, among other things. And uh, the, the, the a debate in this context, debate is not possible. This uh, speaks about the current state of the uh, public life in Poland. Poland is divided and this division uh, goes deeper than in the days of the Polish People's Republic. Uh, greater aggression, greater hatred uh, between the two uh, segments of the society, two parts of the society. And Lech Walesa is in the middle and attitude to Lech Walesa to a great extent defines attitude to the solidarity movement, to the, uh, to the events of 1989 and to the state which uh, was built after 1989 and to the modern day history we're talking about today. If I may, I would like to join in Professor Frischke. Uh, you spoke uh, about the historical uh, uh, historical perspective. I would like to speak about the modern day perspective. Uh, this division line is very deep. Uh, it goes back to 2005 when for the first time, maybe not for the first time, but on a constant basis, uh, two uh, political forces uh, were elected that date back and see their uh, roots, uh, trace their roots to the opposition movement. Uh, from 2005, again, uh, because of this tragic division, uh, this division uh, grew in 2010, and uh, it's about uh, the argument or dispute over over the past. That's at the crux of the problem, and this. Uh, the debate is over who represents the true solidarity movement, who is the true successor of the solidarity movement. And the uh, argument over Lech Valenza is also part and parcel of this broader dispute, uh, broader debate. It's a very complex, very difficult question for historians because we are emotionally uh, engaged, emotionally related, but we try to write our historical works uh, uh, with a cool head outside of this historical context. It's difficult because whatever we write about solidarity now will be interpreted in the context of, of the present day political debate, not in the uh, context of the past. The same goes for Lech Walesa, uh, claim that he uh, cooperated with the security services uh, has been proven. Uh, and so after 1980, uh, one party would not uh, take this person seriously. Another side claims that even though this cooperation did take place in 1982, Lech Valenza uh, refused to represent the policy of the authorities because the authorities that were toying with the idea of creating a new solidarity, Lech Valencia thought it would be impossible. And so the other side of the society uh, wouldn't listen to him either. So for them, uh, Lech Valencia is a person uh, who is defined by the fact that he cooperated with the security services, that he was an agent. For them, that's a defining factor. It's a difficult time to write about the opposition, the solidarity movement, uh, to write about the solidarity heroes. And Lech Valenza uh, is uh, clearly um, still a uh, leader of the solidarity movement. And uh, this uh, debate also touches on other issues it's a deep run debate over the past. Uh, uh, it touches on the image of the opposition, the image of the solidarity and other representatives of the opposition movement. I wouldn't want to go into detail, uh, but from a political perspective, some structures, some people uh, 
they they go beyond the framework of history. Their merits are belittled. It's a difficult time for historians, but we wouldn't give up. I hope that uh, that internal historian historical debates, which are getting more and more uh, agitated, because the historical society is also divided. Uh, the present should not have such a huge sway over the past. I would like to uh, clarify one comment just to make sure people understood me correctly. I agree with the uh, def definition of the situation and, and the, his, his account of the situation. Uh, but Mr. Uh, Kaminsky, uh, Lech Valenza, as a worker, he was arrested late 70s, early 80s by the security services, and he uh, agreed to cooperate. And sometime later, met with the security officer and the documents confirming the cooperation. Uh, it was done uh, through Kaminsky. Uh, the documents were published. The history of those contacts, if I remember correctly, uh, they were limited to February 1986 when Valencia. Uh, uh, ceased all contacts with the security services, and nobody can uh, challenge this fact. The uh, contacts in 1971-76, they, they did exist, but uh, the scandal, uh, the controversy, we can use this word, the question was whether Valencia was an independent uh, uh, politician and uh, independent figure. And uh, I was actually head of the Institute of the National Remembrance, and we couldn't find a single document uh, showing that Lech Valencia uh, resumed cooperation, agreed to or was cajoled into uh, some compromises with the security services. Nothing of this kind was found or published, but uh, the uh, polemics around the uh, role of Valenza, uh, this uh, is no longer, uh, is, this, this, this doesn't work as an argument. Um, so this uh, crosses out uh, all his uh, future successes uh, for many people. Thank you so much. Marco Zivon, please. Uh, please unmute uh, the microphone of Mark Radzivon. I would like to, I would like to add, uh, to make a couple more comments on Valenza. Professor Fischke uh, has already explained everything. When we talk about uh, a dispute between researchers about the differences of their uh, positions, between their positions, it's an, an incorrect definition. In Poland nowadays, we are uh, in a state of vulgar populism, which is actually using the issue of Valencia to its political ends. As Professor said, we don't have any proof that Valencia was cooperating with the security services post-1976, and we believe that he ended any whatever cooperation he had after that. Uh, but I would, I would like to add and maybe ask a question to what Professor Fischke has said in the first part of his uh, 
intervention. When we uh, define descent or limit descent to uh, those people who used to be in the party, who used to be Marxist, and then at some point uh, during the thaw period, uh, around 1956, who decided to uh, leave the party. Uh, to surrender their uh, party cards, party membership cards. The definition given by Professor Fischke does not really square well with the dissidents in Russia, the Soviet Union, because this definition would mean that, that this, then the, 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 this definition of dissent would include General Grigorenko, However, other significant dissidents would not be covered by this uh, notion, Bukovsky, uh, Sergei Kovalev, uh, and others. So those who never had anything in common with communism or had anything to do with communist party, uh, who never entertain any uh, sympathies towards Marxism. That means that Alexander Yurich already said at the beginning, we shouldn't get hung up on the definitions. We don't want them to dominate uh, our debate. I think we need to uh, single out uh, human rights defenders from the, from the dissidents. So a dissident in that case would be a person who uh, never entertained any liking for Marxism. Be dissident, the word stems from the English word dissent, meaning to oppose, oppose the system. Not only uh, the editors of the uh, Europe magazine, which which was a failing magazine, with those people who surrendered their party membership uh, cards. Uh, I think there would be. It is now the proper moment uh, to give the floor to Mr. Daniel. Well, actually, I have several remarks I would like to convey, but I'll try to be as succinct as possible. Speaking about Europe, uh, the encyclopedia uh, text, the Russian text, Europe is mentioned only once uh, in passing in Mr. Prishka's uh, article in his entry, uh, a literary club Europe. Maybe it's not um, the most exact translation or formula. Maybe it should, it should have been expanded, but that's how it was written in the article. So, but I think it's a, uh, it's a very important mention of this club in Professor Frischke's article. That's my first point. Uh, now on to Lech Valenza's cooperation with the security services. It is mentioned in the bio profile of Lech Valenza. Jan Skuzinski is the contributor. So uh, it states that there is information available or that there are debates in the Polish society on this matter. I don't want to get hung up on this topic. I understand that it is a very sensitive issue to our colleague counterparts. I would like to remind you that we, with uh, Zbigniew Gluza, we wrote a forward to this 
to this book. To include or not to include uh, different biographies into the encyclopedia. It's not about uh, giving marks, grading people's contribution, giving away prizes. It's not in any way an assessment on the uh, the moral traits. Uh, it's just a statement, uh, confirmation that this or that person played this or that role in those events and those activities uh, which we uh, decided to call uh, very broadly a dissident activity. We didn't intend to uh, give away prizes uh, and, and, and give grades. These are just bios, no more, no, no less. Uh, Zbigniew and myself, uh, we, we understood that the readers would probably miss this point, but uh, we still uh, thought it, it was necessary to, uh, to write those articles in the way they were written. Uh, so it, it is a mere collection of bio profiles, of biographies. It has nothing to do with sympathies or antipathies or political assessments or anything of this kind. We did not select uh, the uh, people to be included or excluded on the basis of whether they were good or bad. A brief remark on what Yurai Marushak was talking about. I don't want to uh, get involved into the dispute of the Slavs among themselves, but uh, but it seems to me, as as far as I could familiarize with the material in the course of the work on this book, alternative culture for the for, for for the Czech Republic was just as important as for Slovakia as a, as, as a as a driving force behind uh, dissent uh, four words uh, can be uh, said a plastic um, mannequins or plastic toys of the people of the universe. Uh, those rock concerts uh, started a, a wave of opposition, a wave of dissent uh, in the Czech Republic and in Slovakia in, in equal measure. And it is the history of the plastic peoples of the universe. Uh, it basically led the way to the creation of uh, Charter 77. Isn't it? So that's the impression I've, I've had after I've worked through a lot of materials in preparation of this book. Uh, Pet Petr Paspichel, uh, his request, uh, verbal history of dissent, uh, oral history, uh, work is underway. There are two books, uh, Gleb Morev's book uh, published recently, consisting of uh, interviews with dissidents and a book by Alexander Arkhangelsky, Free People, which also consists of interviews with dissidents and Memorial is continuing its work in this area. We have several projects related to the, um, the online uh, presentation of uh, dissidents' lives. Uh, Petr, you're right. We understand that. And we try to uh, 
uh, uh, to uh, to do it as much as we can. So. Uh, that's my response. Alexander Yurievich, uh, thank you so much. Yes, there are very many comments, many points, many areas uh, we haven't touched upon. Although we are uh, moving rapidly towards the end of our webinar, I would like to ask our engineer to unmute Yuri Marushak. And I would like to say a few words about uh, bibliography uh, and undemocratically we actually fail to ask our audience whether the audience uh, has any questions so if you have any questions remarks now is the time to uh, let us know about it and on we move in the in this direction Yuray Maroshak, very briefly uh, to respond to, um, to Alexander Yurievich's comment. What's the difference between, say, uh, the Slovak and the Czech dissident movements? Uh, in Slovakia, the whole infrastructure of the, of the opposition movement of Samizdat was uh, created by representatives of alternative culture or by representatives of the Catholic religious underground. And each society, each country uh, had uh, infrastructure of, of the opposition. Each country has its own environment uh, for the growth of the infrastructure. And when the, the opposition movement was formed, uh, which then led to the collapse of the communist regime, uh, civil forum, for example, the, the core of the uh, forum, it was Charter 77. In Slovakia, that core emerged among the alternative culture representatives of Bratislava organization, Artists' Union, and Bratislava-based environmental organization. So it shows you the difference between Slovakia and the Czech Republic. In Slovakia, consisted of the people who, uh, in most cases, did did not work or were not engaged with uh, underground structures uh, or illegal structures. Uh, they were operating in the gray area, uh, recognized official organizations such as the Artists' Union. Thank you so much. And uh, please uh, unmute uh, Alexander Sikalin and Mr. Makarov. Thank you so much uh, for all the public bibliographical uh, information, all the all the notes you sent us, um, we will save them. The question is, uh, how did uh, the dissident movement, how was the dissident movement viewed in the Soviet Union? And I think it's a huge question. Uh, if I may, I would like to ask you to comment on what you heard today as an expert in Hungary and as a person who uh, actually is, was in charge of the bibliography. We do not hear you. You are unmuted, but we do not hear you. Now you are muted. Okay, you're muted now. Could you please unmute uh, our engineer? I'm asking our engineer.
Нет, звук выключен. Нет, вас, вас совсем не слышно. Вас no, we cannot hear you. No sound is coming through. I don't know what the technical issue is. Alexander Sergeyevich, uh, no sound coming through. Alexei, maybe you will pick up, maybe you'll tell us uh, while we're sorting out what happened. So there were some questions addressed to you in the chat box. Uh, people asked you to give the floor to you because uh, you know you were in charge of bibliography. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I actually uh, provided assistance uh, of to the work on uh, volume two. Uh, it was even more difficult. Not all languages were in the Cyrillic or Latin languages. Uh, no, no, no. And Natasha Garbanevska left, and then there was another attempt, uh, a more successful attempt. Uh, the, so the first volume is published. Valya Chubarova, Andrei Pavlovich, Kerzum, and myself, we uh, Ran into. Uh, we became obvious that we uh, we need to update uh, not only biographies but also bibliographies. It turned out to be quite difficult because they're very different areas. Um, you know, the books published in the national languages in different countries and the Russian contemporary bibliography, the ed editions which were mentioned in the commentaries, uh, there are references uh, to those books there in the bibliography. The, th the problem is that in the 70s and 80s, a lot of materials uh, were published by, by immigrant publishing houses, both national immigrant publishing houses, uh, for example, Kultura, Polish uh, publishing house, which was published in France, and Russian uh, publishing houses, Continent, Ruska Mysl, and, and, other, and other publishing houses that were publishing materials on the state of the uh, opposition movements in the Soviet Union, Central Eastern European countries. And we had to look for all those sources. We had to uh, clean them up a bit. Natasha Grbanevska uh, was in love with Poland, with Czechoslovakia. So the number of references to the Russian thought was enormous. So we had to find the right balance. We had to take into account the new books, the new, uh, the new publications, to say nothing of the English, French language publications, because they, they are available as well. So it was a, a quite a, an interesting, although quite challenging work. Um, so the most difficult thing was to find bibliography for one of the Belarusian dissidents who is known. He is the author of, if I'm not mistaken, of the modern day uh, coat of arms of Belarus. He is an, an, an artist, so we we, we, tr we try to find his books, and in all those books, he wasn't cited, listed as an author, but as an illustrator. So there are very different people uh, that were incorporated into the encyclopedia. Biographies open up new documents. Uh, we go to the archive and we find out that some uh, Latvian dissidents were KGB agents. Uh, 
not quite clear whether they uh, cooperated or not, provided information or not. And, and also that there were similar issues with biographies. Thank you. Thank you. If our, the question is uh, if, if our audience uh, members have any questions. Ferenc Kosek. Uh, please unmute uh, Mr. Kosig. Uh, please unmute Mr. Kosig. Yes, you can speak, but uh, you're muted again. Uh, Ferenc, we cannot hear you. Uh, you're muted. Probably on your side, your sound is off. No, 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 we, we don't hear you. No sound coming through. Unfortunately, no sound coming through. Uh, you need to have a, a, a mic icon uh, on the left in the bottom. So it's it, uh, uh, the screen returned because uh, the, even the screen disappeared, but now screen is mm -hmm. on and, and I think that you can hear, now, hear me now, can't you? Da, спасибо. Okay. So, uh, uh, I have, has, have one remark, uh, talking about uh, uh, this question, opposition or dissent or dissenting, uh, 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 as uh, this, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, this representative, the Carta from Poland, uh, came to Hungary and organized the encyclopedia at the beginning of the, of the, of the, of the mid-90s. Mid then uh, she organized a meeting but different groups of the, uh, this, uh, this uh, different this uh, different dissenting groups were represented. So the uh, so-called democratic opposition, which we can uh, call opposition, and uh, also uh, representatives of the of the uh, populist opposition, uh, which uh, does exist even now. No. And and uh, one of the of the uh, uh, people present on this meeting uh, su suggested that uh, Mr. Pozga should be involved in this uh, in this list and this uh, uh, biography should be uh, written about him. Uh, Mr. Mr. Pozga was a member of the communist uh, of the political committee of the Communist Party, so one of the uh, highest uh, bodies of the of the. Uh, Communist Party, but certainly he was uh, rather uh, nationalistically minded, populistically minded, and therefore he was the idol of the of the uh, uh, populist opposition. And then this uh, this uh, Polish uh, ladies um, said that uh, he, uh, she cannot uh, uh, cannot involve a member of the political committee into the into the list of the of the opposition people or the distant people because in in Poland everybody would laugh that uh, the Hungarians would like to would like to uh, to put a, a member of the of the communist political committee into the list of the opposition people but at the same time uh, uh, Mr. Lantos uh, the uh, uh, congressman of the United States, who is of Hungarian origin, and he was, the, I think, the leader of the Committee for Human Rights or something. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, Alliance of Free Democrats, which was a party in the Hungarian Parliament, uh, based on the on the tradition and the, and the persons of the democratic opposition, and we uh, initiated. A referendum against Mr. Mr. Pozgai because uh, uh, the, the Communist Party wanted him to make a uh, president of the Repub Republic. 
and uh, uh, the uh, um, referendum was organized against this decision. And uh, on the very end, the referendum was goes through, and uh, and Posgay lost his possibility to be the first uh, constitutional leader of the of the new democratic uh, uh, regime. Uh, but this this uh, congressman from United States was absolutely upset. Say uh, that what what is, what what an idea is from the from this. Uh, so-called liberal party, he said, uh, to organize a, re a referendum against Pozgai. Pozgai is a Hungarian Gorbachev. So he, it, it would be very good uh, to, uh, to be a, a, a head of state uh, under the uh, end of communism. Uh, uh, so that uh, in, in this, in this uh, uh, context, he was considered as a, as a dissenting person. But certainly not an opposition person. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, all the attendees, speakers, organizers, because a lot of efforts were put into making this webinar a reality. Interpreters' work, interpreters' efforts, uh, technical personnel, thank you, everybody. I hope that the materials of our today's webinar will appear on the new webpage of Memorial in the section Dissidents both the web page the site and the encyclopedia in this web page of oh, this this webinar they were made possible by the Carter center and i hope that no matter what happens um, all uh, th this will be will become a reality and um, the recording of our today's webinar will be available today and um, the, the transcript of all the presentations and all comments will be made available later. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your uh, readiness to join our webinar and participate in it.